start off with, um, all of my messages with a little, little facts, some little fun things. Did you know, especially you, uh, you graduates, did you know this? That you learn 75 to 80 percent of everything that you will ever know by the time you're five years old. By the time you're five, you know 75 to 80 percent of everything that you will ever know. Uh, I thought that that statistic was amazing, especially knowing that um, <clears throat> AJ's at preschool and he brings home some of his homework and I have to say, uh, you're going to have to go to your mom, okay? <laughs> so uh, I've already forgotten a lot of the stuff that I learned back then. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, I like to, uh, you know, to talk to the men sometimes in the room and, and real men don't read instructions. <laughs> Waste of paper. Real men don't read instructions the first time. <laughs> what we normally do is we say, you know, I can put this together. I saw a picture. And then you look at the people whenever you're done and your contraption is standing there and you say, why did they send these extra parts? That's ridiculous. It's a waste of money, I tell you. This thing looks just fine. Uh, real men don't read instructions the first time. Uh, these dummies put these extra parts in there. I think it's hilarious. Also, um, I don't know how many of you uh, are, you know, the first thing I do whenever I come home and sit down on the couch, I won't sit down unless I have something in my hand, and that is the remote control. And uh, have you ever had your remote control go haywire on you? And you'll sit there, and you will go through, I know how to, this is my best friend, this is my real best friend, the dog poops in the house, but this is my real best friend. <laughs> And, and so you go through all sorts of things. Why isn't this thing working properly? You'll hit it gently because it's your best friend. You'll hit it. You'll try all sorts of things. You'll go through all sorts of settings and, and wonder why isn't the volume working on the TV. And you, you keep going through all these things and then you finally get to that manual. And the first thing it says, did you check the batteries? <sighs> I'm so sorry, remote control. I will get you some more life, and I will put it back into you. And so what I, what I thought about during that, uh, all these thoughts here are leading us to a point. And uh, the, the first thing, I always want to yell at instructions. Sometimes, like if you've ever seen a hair dryer, it says, do not do, not do this in the shower, a hair dryer. And so I always yell out this thing, and maybe you've heard it before, is thank you, Captain Obvious. Have you, ever heard, have you ever used those terms before? Thank you, Captain Obvious, for saying what is obvious. Why would I want to dry my hair while I am washing my hair? Really? <laughs> but there is instructions on there. Do not use while in the bath. Duh. Thank you, Captain Obvious. There's a scripture that I wanted to read that God shared with me during worship today, and it's uh, especially... To all of us, I, I believe that all of us it, are. <laughs> I believe that all of us are graduating to something. Um, I believe that whenever we walk out of this room, that all of us can walk back out of this place changed for the better, right? All of us can graduate to a new level in our life. And uh, this scripture has always been used for a long time. It's in 1 Corinthians. It's not going to be up at your screen. You're just going to take my word for it unless you have a Bible in your hand. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it's right after it gets done talking about love. And then it says, it's like this. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child does. But when I grew up, somebody say, grew up. I put away childish things. And I think that that's so awesome. So today, um, as, as a, uh, not taking this lightly, standing in this pulpit, I promise to you to put aside childish things and to stand up here and to preach to you what I believe God wants us to preach and not try to sugarcoat it, not try to put anything on it because just like these graduates, we are all grown-ups and we can take what God has to say to us. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Obvious. Uh, it's going to be our key term today. Everybody say obvious. obvious. Obvious defined is simply this. Easily perceived or understood. Some synonyms of obvious are evident, undeniable, and as we like to say down here in the South, clear as a bell. You ever heard that term before, clear as a bell? Something's obvious, it's as clear as a bell. Something that's obvious that, that to you, you know and you realize that it's something that is absolutely evident. But in, 
in my life some of the best things that I've ever heard, some of the best messages that I've ever heard preached, some of the best lessons that I've ever read in a book, some of the best tweets that I've read on Twitter or on Facebook are some of those things that are absolutely obvious, but it seemed hidden to me. And let me explain something to you young people that are graduating. Don't ignore the obvious, because trust me, the enemy wants to. And don't listen to this old people, too. If you don't think I'm talking about you, I probably was. All right. Don't ignore the obvious things in your life. Don't ignore the evident undeniable, clear as a bell things in your world. Most of the time, those things are something that is completely obvious, but it seems like it's been hidden from us. So we're going to open up Scripture. We're going to go over to Matthew chapter 3. Turn over there with me. Um, it's amazing Scripture. It's from a guy named John the Baptist. Um, John the Baptist was preaching, and, uh, and he had one simple message. Anybody know what that message was? Don't shout it out. I'm going to tell you. If you know what it was, just go, yeah, I know what it was. Well, simply this. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2 reads like this. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins. All right, everybody say repent. repent. I know this message is one of those hard messages, but we're going to talk about repentance today. Father... As we've read your word, God, I pray that right now, Lord, that you would use me, God, as, Lord, as your instrument, God, that I would not be, Lord Jesus, up here saying anything on my own accord, but, Lord, I would be saying what you have put into me, God, what I feel confident that you have put into me. God, say it to the hearts of every person, Lord, not just these graduates, but to all of us. Say it, God, and, Lord, to you be the glory for it, in Jesus' name. And everybody say it one more time. All right, I'm going to describe what repentance means, and I want to try to visualize it as best I can for you. All right, whenever we are struggling with sin, the Bible says that if we have it, and pretend like I have it over here, and let's just use this side of the stage as the sin side of stage, and that we can't hold on to our sin and just say, I'm sorry, and just continue to walk in our sin. What we have to do, what the Bible says we have to do, is we have to repent of our sins, which simply means lay it down, turn our backs to our sin, and walk away from it without it and any evidence of it on us. That's what repentance is. I looked through a hundred scriptures yesterday, and all of them said one thing. It didn't say, ask for forgiveness and it shall be given to you. It said, repent of your sins and then forgiveness will follow. It doesn't say that you can... Continue to hold on to all of the sin that you can hold on to and continue to walk. I'm walking towards you, God, but I got all this stuff with me. It's not saying that. What it says simply is that you must let go of your sin, repent of it, which means turning away from it. So many times people say, I don't know which to go ahead. I like you. So many times people say, I don't know where God wants me to go. I don't know what God wants me to do. I just can't figure it all out right now. Let me tell you where God is. In the opposite direction of the sin in your life. So whenever you don't know what to do and you can feel completely surrounded by the world and all those things, turn your back to that stuff. If that means ending relationships, then do it. If that means moving your computer... Then move your computer or throw it in the trash and say, I have to get away from it and I have to leave it in my past. And what direction does God want me to walk? In the opposite direction of your sin. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. That's what repentance is. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32, we find Jesus. He is standing in, in Jerusalem and he's talking to religious leaders inside the temple. All right, He's not out in the street talking to the multitudes. He's talking to the religious leaders. And this is what he said. Now you got to understand, he is talking to them about repentance. And he's talking to them because when we first read the scripture in Matthew 3, it was John the Baptist saying, repent of your sins, turn from your wicked ways, and follow after God, for the kingdom of God is near. Now Jesus is talking in those amazing red letters, and this is what he says. He says, but what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. 
The son answered, no, I won't go. But later, he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, or the younger son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two sons, he looks at the religious leaders, he asked them this question, because they were asking him, who gives you the authority? He looks, at the, he looks at them and he asks them this question about after he explains these two sons. He said, which of the two obeyed the father? Of course, they replied, the first son. He said, then Jesus explained his meaning. Now, you've got to understand, this is, <laughs> this is Jesus talking to religious leaders. He says, I tell you the truth, corrupt, wicked, sinners tax collectors, and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. He said, because you're so busy saying what you're going to do and never doing it. But then you actually, he says, and the, yet these others at first kicked against it, but they have yet fallen into line. He's talking to religious leaders. And what that basically says to me is that repentance is something that we need to talk about, not just out in the streets. But we need to talk about it in the church. Because that's where Jesus talked about it, was in the church. And what that means to me is that we as church people, we as religious leaders, we need to be told the obvious truth. And that is we need to repent. We need to repent. Even people who go to church need to repent. One of the most obvious truths in God's scripture is this, is that all of his promises and all of his goodness are free. Everything that God wants to give us is absolutely free, but they are <coughs> conditional. They are something, this is something that I, I constantly am preaching to young people all the time, is that God's promises are free, and He wants you to have everything that He's wanting to give you, but there's some conditions tied to it. He wants to give you the kingdom of God, but He said the first thing you have to do is what? Repent. <coughs> He says, you've got to let go of this world so that you can be not of this world. You have to let go of everything, even church people. Even church people. Sometimes, I'm sorry, isn't good enough. I like the illustration of credit. You know, you go to, uh, you're young, and you make some credit mistakes. All right? You know, I don't know if anybody else in the room did. But I, I made some credit mistakes, okay? And so, as a young person, you know you see this brand new credit, everything's good. And then you make some mistakes. And then you're like, oh, I'm already late now, might as well not even pay it. <laughs> and then it begins to haunt you. And as you get older and you mature, you realize, this is really haunting me. And you start taking care of your bills. Or let's, let's just take two pads here. One person says, hey, if I can borrow it, I'm going to get it. As much as I can. Alright, so you go to a lender and you look at them and you say, you know, 10 years ago I had some credit problems. And uh, they hadn't got much better. I don't even pay attention. I don't pay anybody. Would you let me borrow some money? And they say, uh, no. But you go to somebody and you say, you know, 10 years ago I had some credit problems. But in the last eight years, I haven't missed a payment. I haven't missed anything. I've got a lot of debt paid off. Everything's really good now. I do have some skeletons in my closet. I got some bad credit, but I was young and I was stupid. But, you know, in the last eight years, I haven't missed anything. That creditor will look at you and say, this is a mature person. This is somebody who has changed. Are you listening to me, young people? Don't get yourself in these type of binds. And they say, all right, now I will lend to you. Because why? Because you changed. You repented of your ways. You didn't just keep on saying, well, I ain't going to pay those bills. You said, I'm going to pay for them, and I'm going to be a mature and honest adult. All right? So what I'm saying by that is this, is that we understand what repentance means in that type of frame of mind. Everybody say, uh-huh. Okay? We understand what it means whenever we change our ways, and all of a sudden things start to work back out into our favor. All right. Let's go to the story of Jonah. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Um, I've actually took the time to memorize the entire message that Jonah preached to Nineveh. All right? And I'm going to show off in front of you today, and I'm going to preach that entire message that Jonah spoke. All right, now we all know the story, right? Jonah is supposed to go to Nineveh. He hates Nineveh. He don't like him. And so he decides to run in the other direction. God sends a storm. They throw him out of the boat. Big old fish. Uh, you know, takes him in and then puts him out. 
And, uh, and then he finds himself standing there on the shore again and saying, okay, yes, Lord, just like the little kid who's got a spanking, I will clean my room. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I understand. Jonah knew what he was doing. And so he got to Nineveh and he preached this message. Here I go. I'm going into monologue state. The city will be destroyed in 40 days. That's all he said. That's it. Thank you. So here until Thursday. All right. That's all he said. They knew who he was. They knew he was a man from Israel. They knew he was a man of God. And they knew that they were dirty, rotten sinners. All right. People that were bad, bad people. And all he said is, your city will be destroyed in 40 days. God, I did it. There. Took him three days. He'd walk a few hundred yards and he'd say it again. And what did the city do? We all know the story. The, from the king to all of the cattle, all of the animals, everybody, all the way down to the itty bitty babies, all of them fasted. Everybody took off all of their jewelry, all of their, their fine linens, and they put on sackcloth and they put ashes on their face. For 40 days, even babies didn't eat. And God forgave them. Why? Because they repented. Because they changed. What's driving me crazy, and what's driving God crazy, I believe, is that so many people have bought into this false doctrine that all you have to do is ask forgiveness and you can still hold on to your sin and you can still walk in God's way. Whatever the truth is, You've got to let it go. You've got to let God have it. And you've got to give God and you've got to repent. Turn your back. If that means ending a relationship, guess what? End it. If that means deleting your Facebook, delete it. If that means changing your phone number, change your phone number. If that means offending somebody, offend them. It ain't worth it. Repent of your sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. <coughs> Some of the best scriptures in the world, first of all, my, my top favorite, number one favorite scriptures, all have red letters in them. Jesus' words. Then my second favorite are any of the epistles of the letter Paul, or letters from Paul. They are amazing. Paul knew how to put words together. He knew how to say what needs to be said. Some of the things that, uh, that he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 are right here. It says, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience. Yeah, no, let's stop. Let's don't just read past that. The kind of sorrow, listen to me young people, the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience what does that sorrow do? It leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance. But listen to me, there's another type of sorrow. It's a worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in death. What does that mean? The best illustration of that is comparing Judas and Peter. Now we know we just saw our, our illustration of Peter and Petra and, and we saw those different types of things. But I want to talk to you about Judas. Because see Judas, a lot of people have given Judas uh, you know, a hard time, which deservedly so. He, he betrayed Jesus. And some people are even, uh, there's so many different, you know, looks on the way Judas was. Uh, but a lot of people think that Judas was trying to force Jesus into a situation where he had to let the whole world know who he was. They thought that he was trying to force Jesus into a situation where he had to say, all right, I am the King of Kings and I am the Lord of Lords. And if I can force him into that, trying to manipulate him. He was trying to do something that a lot of people think he was trying to do good. Teach into his own, to whatever you want to believe. What I want to talk to you about is how he responded after he did what he did. Of course, we all know he did what he did. He kissed Jesus on the cheek. He identified Jesus. And now Peter looks at Jesus earlier the same night. and He says, there's no way I'll deny you. And he says, surely I, I tell you this. You will deny me three times this very night. 
Now, what we, you know, what we have always taught in, in Sunday school and, and in children's church and in all of these things is that, yeah. is that Peter just said, no, I don't know him. No. But by the third time they asked Peter that night, it said that Peter was cursing and saying that I got nothing to do with him. And he was trying to look so much like the world to just not identify himself. He had truly denounced and betrayed the love of his life, his Jesus. He had done that. But what was the difference between what Judas did and what Peter did? I'm here to tell you nothing. But how they responded in the end goes back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Because you can read in scripture, Judas goes back to the men that paid him the 30 pieces of silver. And he says, here, take it back. Let's undo what we've done. I'm sorrowful. And I'm sorry. And he went back to the people of the world and he said, take it back. And they just laughed at him and they said, sorry. Too late now. I don't know what you're talking about. What's done is done. And he took and he threw the 30 pieces of silver. And he was so sorrowful. So sorry. But he never repented. But what did Peter do? It says Peter got on his face and repented and turned from his wicked ways and said, I'll never do that again. He had a repentant heart. The question is, is this, how do I know if I have repented? And there's the most obvious statement. And you can look at me and you can yell, thank you, Captain Obvious. But here's the truth. How do you know if you've repented? If you're still making excuses and you're still justifying your sin, you haven't repented. If you're still trying to make everybody understand, well, this is why I did it, then you just have a worldly sorrow. You don't have repentance. And so whenever you step up, young people hear me, and you take the responsibility and you say, I'm responsible. I did wrong. And I am sorry for it. And I have gotten on my face before God and every single person that I have hurt. I have told them that I am sorry and I have repented. And that is no longer me. And I have put it to my past. And it's behind me now. That's repentance. Sometimes the obvious is really hard to see. Sometimes the obvious can really... Uh, that's why this sermon seems so good. That's why I hope this sermon seems so good. Because it's an obvious statement. It's right there in scripture. But for some reason, I don't know why, it's been hidden from a lot of preachers uh, today. Luke chapter 24 verse 47, and I'm closing, is this. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations. This is Jesus talking in the red letters before he ascends into heaven. He said, you've been given all authority. Young people with caps and gowns on, our graduates here, you have been given all authority to proclaim to the nations. What does he say? Beginning there in Jerusalem, there is no forgiveness of sins or there is forgiveness of sins without repentance. And some translations say there is no forgiveness of sins without repentance. We have to repent. And what I see in that scripture there is what we're going to do later. You guys are going to carry your candle out into this world. And I hope that they are inspiration to all of us. That we realize that it is not up to us to just repent. But it's up to us to proclaim to the world. Listen, you guys... Y'all are grown. As much as me and your parents don't want to see you guys grow up, the fact is you are. And you're going to be held to some standards and some responsibilities. And adults, I hope you're listening to this. I hope you don't say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I hope that you're hearing this. We're all held as adults to a responsibility to take care of our relationship with God first. And there are people all in this congregation here. But see, the enemy, he comes to, he comes to pervert what God created to be good. On Wednesday night, God gave me a message. 
and I can't shake, and it has shook me to the core, and God says, I want you to say it again this morning. We're talking about lust. We're, talking, we're in a series about purity. And God was talking about that, that desire and that, that, that you feel, that lust that we all know how strong it can be. He said that's been perverted and that's been misdirected because that's the passion that I wanted. That's what I wanted. That's how I wanted you to feel about me, but the enemy's coming to your heart and he's misdirected that passion and he's put it on other things. And you continue to give it to other things, but that's what I want. That's what I want. That's where I want. I want that type of passion out of you. And he goes on to say, in the word that God dropped in my spirit, is simple. He said, we're so concerned about deleting our internet history. And deleting what the world may find to convict us of doing wrong, sinful things. That we are about reading his word and repenting to him. We're so concerned with worldly sorrows that we are the sorrow that God wants us to feel. That we've become so misdirected that we think. That if we just continuously carry our sin and say we're sorry for it, that it's going to be good enough. And let me explain something to you. God accepts you just the way you are, but he does not accept the sin. So if you can't let go of the sin, then he can't grab a hold of you. I read a scripture in the beginning that said there comes a time to put aside childish things. There comes a time when you have to deal with your sin. And you have to set it down and you have to turn your back to it. And you have to walk out in dangerous waters and say, I don't know how, I'm dirty, I'm filthy rags, but I don't have anything else left, God. And you cling a hold of Him. And whenever that happens, the Bible says He'll make you white as snow. That's whatever... You know He loves you. And yet so many times we get so convicted or holding on to all of these things and we're so concerned with our worldly sorrow that we start blaming God. Why don't you love me? And he's saying, if you just let it go, I'll be able to wrap you up. And I'll be able to take you. It's our responsibility to let this world know and to let our families know and to let ourselves know that we need to repent. We need to repent. We are all responsible today. I want each and every one of us to know that when we walk out of this room, we all have been promoted to the level of captain. Each and every one of us, you might not be able to, to pilot an aircraft or a boat, but every single one of us have been promoted to captain in God's army. Look at your neighbor and say, you are Captain Obvious. Tell the world the obvious things of God. If you would stand with me and close your eyes. As you're standing, uh, I put a huge emphasis on closing your eyes. Uh, what I tell the teenagers every Wednesday night, that if you're looking around, when I say every eye closed and nobody looking around, I pray that your eyeballs fall out. <laughs> so, I can guarantee, whenever I say every eye closed, nobody looking around, that every eye is closed. And nobody is looking around. Today, if you don't know Jesus, the life you've led, the decisions that you've made, you have uh, asked Jesus to stay over here on the salvation side, and you said, I'm going to set up camp over and sin. Because I know you can't live over here, Jesus. I choose sin over you, and this morning, all of a sudden, something's happening inside of your chest, and you feel the draw of the Holy Spirit can't come to the Father unless you are drawn by the Holy Spirit and you accept Jesus. And all of a sudden you're feeling a sensation on the inside of your heart. You're feeling something on the inside of you. And that's the draw of the Holy Spirit. And you say, I need to invite Jesus back into my life. I need to repent of my sins. And I need to get Jesus back into my heart. If that's you, I promise nobody's looking around. 
If that's you, raise up your hand. Say, I need to invite Jesus into my life. I need to repent. Just raise it up. There's hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is there any more? Down your hands. Is there any more? Everybody in the building, say this prayer with me. Everybody, but especially you seven that raised your hand. Say, Jesus, I repent. And I walk towards you. Forgive me. And cleanse me of my sins. I need you in my life. Helping me. Make me whole. In Jesus' name. Keep every eye closed. Nobody looking around. Talking to believers now. Should be everybody in the room. All believers. Let me explain something to you. Jesus was talking to the religious leaders. And he was telling them that they need to repent too. Please nobody leave just yet because we still have the candlelight and the ceremony to go. But if you say, you know, Pastor Dustin, I've got Jesus in my heart, but I'm holding a lot of things that I need to repent of. And you want me to help you pray for those things? And you just want to admit to God right now, hey, I need to repent of some things. I've got Jesus, but I'm still trying to hold on to something. If that's you and you say, hey, I need to repent, raise up your hands. There's hands all over. Literally hundreds of hands raised. You can put them down. Father, you see us, God. You see your people, God. All of us dealing with something in our life, God, that we need to repent of, God. Not just say we're sorry, but repent of it. God, I pray that right now, Lord Jesus, that you would touch each and every heart, each and every person that's repenting of whatever it is. Give them the strength to put it down. Turn their back to it and walk away from it, God, and towards you. Lord, to you be the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name. All right, every eye up here looking on me. We're about to light this candle. In honor of these graduates, or they're about to light their candles, and they're going to come up and join with their parents. But it's symbolic. If you choose to walk back out those doors the same way you came in, that's on you. But I believe that each and every one of us, whether we're carrying a candle or not, can walk out those doors, and today can be a life defining moment for us. And we can say that I'll never be the same. I've been promoted, and I will go out and I will tell the world the obvious truth that they need to repent. In Jesus' name, please stay with us. No moving around. Let these graduates exit first. And when they get out there, go by and shake two or three of their hands and tell them how proud you are of them. In Jesus' name. I'm going by, moving ahead. I'm here to declare. 